Greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to my movie vlog. My name is John Campia, and this is the companion video. Now, every day on the John Campia Show and on Open Mic, we take live questions from you guys, but quite often we don't have time to get to all those live questions. So whenever we have questions we don't get to, we compile them all and address them here on the companion video. Now, I'm gonna warn you right now, we've got a couple of days worth of companion questions left over here to get through. So we got a whole shit ton of questions to get through. So I'm gonna go through these as quick as I can. So buckle in, get ready, and let's get things started. And the first question today comes to us from Who Flung Poo who writes, Chappaquiddick review, or did I miss it? No, I didn't do one. Uh, Chappaquiddick is one of those ones where I'm really excited about the movie, but I didn't go to see it because I pretty much knew I wasn't gonna do a review for it because I knew hardly anybody was going to see the film. And sometimes when there's films that I know pretty much no one's gonna see, then that means pretty much no one's gonna watch the review. And so I'll give myself a pass to take a little bit of a break to not see that movie. So I'm really looking forward to this particular movie. I didn't do a review for it and I probably won't do one, unfortunately. I, I don't do one for every single film, clearly. All right, next one comes to us from Kim Lincrus, who writes, finish the Godfather films. What happened with Godfather 3? You know, it's funny, a lot of people crap on Godfather 3, but a lot of people also forget it was nominated for Best Picture. And I think if you take Sofia Coppola out of it, and I love Sofia Coppola, but let's face it, she was, you know, a square peg trying to go into a round hole in that movie. She just didn't fit. You take her out, I thought it was a very good movie. Uh, it feels different than the other Godfather films, but then again, there's a lot of time separating Godfather 2 from Godfather 3, so it should feel different. Michael Corleone is in a different place in his life at that point, so I, I, I gotta say, I like Godfather 3. I like it a lot, as a matter of fact, so I will defend Godfather 3 on this one. All right, uh, Lord of the Wands writes, Yo, amigo, my stupid ex-wife is Canadian. Oh, come on, man, don't talk about your ex-wife that way. And boy, do I miss Tim Hortons, oh yeah. What's your favorite thing to get there? I love their donuts and coffee. Well, donuts and coffee is pretty much all Tim Hortons does, and there's just a lot of Americans that will never understand just how great Tim Hortons is. Like, people, I remember they opened up a Dunkin' Donuts in LA. It's like, Dunkin' Donuts sucks compared to Tim Hortons. I mean, everybody who visits Canada, or all my friends in America, when I go to Canada, if they've ever visited Canada, they all ask me, please bring back some Tim Hortons for us, please. Like Tim Hortons is just it. Now I don't drink coffee, so I can't speak to the quality of the Tim Hortons coffee, but my favorite donut in the world is the Tim Horton Boston Cream Donut. No other Boston Cream Donut in the world comes close. The Tim Horton Boston Cream Donut is my favorite donut in the world. But again, I can't speak to the coffee because I don't drink coffee. All right. Cormac Thurston writes, do you like the Beatles or Zeppelin more? Uh, within your personal taste, also what's your favorite U2 album? Mine is Unforgettable Fire. Well, my favorite album of all time is Joshua Tree. Um, uh, and since I'm, don't throw anything. I don't actually really like the Beatles. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a Beatles fan. I've always grown up ostracized from society because I'm not a big Beatles fan. That's not to say that I don't like a couple of their tunes, but I'm not a big Beatles fan, so I will go Zeppelin on that. Uh, Joseph Farella writes, Hey John, better trilogy, Dark Knight or Captain America? Uh, people ask me that all the time. And it's a tough one to answer because look, clearly out of um, those films, well, you know what? You can't, oh, Civil War is so good, you can't say clearly. I think there's a strong argument to be made that the best single film out of all six is The Dark Knight. And I, I think a lot of people would agree with that. I think you can make a strong, solid argument that The Dark Knight is the best single film out of the six films. But overall, when you looking at the totality of the collective three, because I'll be honest with you, I will take Captain America the First Avenger over Batman Begins, and I'll absolutely take uh, Civil War over The Dark Knight Rises. See, the funny thing about the Dark Knight trilogy is, while I think the strongest film out of the six is in the Dark Knight trilogy, I also think the weakest film out of the six is in the Dark Knight trilogy, and that's uh, Batman, or Dark Knight Rises. That I don't think is a terrible film, not at all. I, I just think it's the weakest out of the six. So, I probably give the edge to the Captain America trilogy, but you know, if you ask me again next week, I might give you a different answer, but I will lean towards the Captain America trilogy. All right, uh, S, C, Edge 77 writes, 
Did you realize Felipe the Sentient Dancing Microphone is on IMDb? Yes, I did, as a matter of fact. 2020, baby. Also, Nashville 1975 poster features Felipe. Um, this is one of the reasons why I tell people don't take IMDb too seriously. Because, especially for films that haven't come out, like for films that have come out and been released, IMDb is pretty much rock solid with its information. But films that are coming out, like somebody says to me, John, did you see on this movie that's coming out in three years, it lists this guy as being in it? And I try to tell people, look, IMDb is a different creature for movies that are still to come out versus how rock solid their information is for movies that have already come out. Because just people can go on there and put up shit. I did not put up that thing about Felipe the Sentient Dancing Microphone, but I did notice it is on IMDb. I didn't put it there. Just another good example that it's not really reliable, 100% reliable for movies that have not come out. Uh, let's see, Luna Comics writes, the Iron Man trilogy or the Wolverine trilogy? Oh. Both have only one really strong entrant in their trilogy. Obviously, Logan and Iron Man 1. You can then debate the quality of the other four films, but I, I think it's pretty safe to say that each of those trilogies only has one entrant each that is really super strong, and that's Logan and the original Iron Man. I'll take Logan over the original Iron Man, um, but I also think the worst film belongs to Logan as well with uh, 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 X-Men Origins Wolverine. I think that's worse than uh, Iron Man 2. So... I don't know. You know what? If I had to choose to sit down and I, I could watch one trilogy this weekend, I could either watch the Iron Man trilogy or I could watch the Wolverine trilogy. I think I'll take the Wolverine trilogy. I'm not going to enjoy all of it, but I'll certainly love the one. So I'll, I'll just for now, again, this is something I could give a different answer to next week. But for now, I'll lean towards uh, the Logan trilogy. OK, uh, SC Edge 77 writes. Uh, the Last Jedi is a better title for Episode 7. The Force Awakens, better for 8. Agree? No, completely disagree. The Last Jedi was a perfect title for Episode 8. And when you understand what's going on, The Force Awakens is the perfect... I, in my opinion, at least, at any rate. Um, I think The Force Awakens is the better title for Episode 7. So, I, I, I mean, you see it a different way. That's totally cool. But I, I happen to see it the opposite way myself. Uh, George Rodriguez writes... As a prequel kid, the spin-offs excite me more. Funny what fans of different ages want out of Star Wars films. Do you believe your age affects what you want? No, I don't think so. I think some people use that as an excuse sometimes, but I know plenty I know plenty of older people, like older than me, that really love the prequels. Uh, I mean, hey, whatever. I mean, all films subjective. That's great if they love them. I think they're steaming piles of garbage, but that's just me. They love them. We're both still Star Wars fans and we're both still friends. Um, and I know some younger people that are much younger than me that really only th consider the original trilogy of Star Wars to be any true Star Wars. So I really don't think so. I, I think there are some people who make ex use that as a crutch or as an excuse sometimes. So I don't think so. But look, I think, George, you just you like the prequels because you like the prequels. There ain't nothing wrong with that in the world. Is, does it influence some people? Yeah, probably. But I don't think it's that hard rule that some people make it out be. Like, there's some people try to say, well, I mean, if you're over the age of 30, then you like the original stuff. If you're under the age of 30, you like the prequels. And that is not true. I'm sure it's true in some cases, sure. But it's as a general rule, it's not true. So, uh, no, I don't think that. I don't think that at all. Uh, the number Thor writes... Do you think we will see Bruce in action in full Batman suit at the end of Gotham? No, I don't think so. I believe the showrunners have said before, I remember, I think just before or during season one of Gotham, I believe I remember the showrunners saying something like, no, no, you're never going to see Batman per se. But you know what? The more I see that show and like the more and more they, it feels like Gotham's turned into nothing now but a Batman T show which I think is really unfortunate because I believe when Gotham is focusing on Jim Gordon, I believe the show works and works at its best. When it's, look everybody, Bruce is wearing a dark mask. He becomes Batman. Did you know that? I mean, it, then it feels kind of sad and pathetic to me. I love Batman, but I mean, that feels sad and pathetic to me. Um, so they've said they were never going to do it, but the more and more you watch the show and the more and more they're relying on the Batman villains gallery and or rogues gallery and and all the the more and more they're putting bruce in the mask and all that kind of stuff i'm the more and more i'm starting to think that maybe they will i'll still say no i'll still take them at their word and believe them when they said no 
but I'm not going to be surprised if they do. And maybe even before the end of the show, it just seems to, to be this desperate need to make it a Batman show when that's not what I felt like it was starting out to be. But hey, who knows? We'll have to wait and see. Uh, number Thor writes, thoughts on the movie Viking with Tony Curtis and Kirk Douglas. Uh, recently watched it and loved it. Oh man, you're going back a ways to Vikings. Um, I were still, I remember the trailer for Vikings. Um, they lived in battle. They died in battle. Oh no, they, no, 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 the only life was life in battle. The only death was death in battle. The only women were women taken in battle. I'm just like, st like shit you cannot get away with putting into a trailer today, right? Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's not one of the films that stands out most to me about films out of that era or even films of Kirk Douglas's. Um, I mean, when I think Kirk Douglas, I think Spartacus, uh, for example. So, yeah, I think I saw Vikings once or twice, but it's not, not like Ben-Hur that I've seen like 20 times, not like Spartacus that I've seen like 50 times or anything like that. But yeah, it was pretty good. I, I dug it. Tony Curtis was actually pretty good. Um, okay. And let's where to go. Okay, here we go. Uh, the one who eats lemons writes, what a great username. Uh, Luke's faith was crushed by the burning down of one Jedi temple and revived by the burning down of another. Watched both from afar with an old friend. I believe you've sent that question in before or somebody else sent in that one. And it's true. I mean, when you look at the imagery in the new Star Wars films, The Force Awakens and The Last Jedi, Luke is broken in the pyre light of his burning Jedi temple with there with R2. But then it's almost like his faith is restored in the Jedi way, watching the tree burn with his friend Yoda. So there is some really nice imagery in that for sure. Um, absolutely. So that's a good observation. All right. Zane Ball writes, what should I see this weekend? Ready Player One or The Quiet or A Quiet Place? You know, it really depends on the mood you're in. Because you couldn't pick two different movies. I mean, two com you couldn't pick two more completely different movies. If you're in the mood for some fun and adventure and whatever, definitely Ready Player One. If you're in it for like a really great story and some scares and whatever, definitely a quiet place. Look, here's the good news, uh, Zane. The good news is you're in a no-lose situation. You win either way. If you get through the next few days and you can say, I've watched Ready Player One, or you can say, I've watched A Quiet Place, you win at life. So you're ahead of the game. So it's a no-lose situation. I, I think I give the edge to A Quiet Place as far as, you know, what's my favorite movies of the year so far. I, I think I put A Quiet Place above Ready Player One, but it's really all depending what the mood you're in for. Again, the good news is there's no wrong answer. All right, let's move on here. The number Thor writes, in your opinion, what do you think will have the bigger 2019 box office, Episode Nine or Avengers 4? Tough to say. I mean, I would have said before, and I have said before that I believe episode nine will, but the reality is Black Panther is coming off. It's getting close to $1.3 billion. Avengers Infinity War will make more than that, I believe. And if it's great, it'll be riding this incredible wave of momentum going into the next Avengers movie next year, that it's hard to imagine it not. But then again, I, I mean, I don't know. The fact of the matter is, every single Star Wars movie that's come out in the last couple of years have all broken the billion dollar mark. You can't say that about the MCU. Um, and if, see, and I also never would have thought that Solo, a Star Wars story would crack a billion dollars. I never thought it would happen. And now it's starting to look like it might. So it is a tough call. I have gone from... Absolutely, Star Wars Episode Nine will be the bigger box office hit. Two, it's a toss-up for me. It's a total toss-up for me. Let's see how Solo does. We already know how Avengers Infinity War is going to do. It's going to do gangbusters. Let's see how Solo does. If Solo does better than I'm thinking, and I still have a hard time imagining it doing better than I think. Like, I, I do not see Solo breaking the billion-dollar mark, but now a lot of people are saying it will. Whatever, we'll have to wait and see. Um, right now, I'll call it a pick'em right now. And I may change that to Avengers a little bit later, but let's see how it all starts to unfold. Uh, number Thor writes, better show, Game of Thrones or Baking, Breaking Bad? Um, for me, Game of Thrones. I like Breaking Bad very much. 
I've got a lot of my friends who say it has to be in the conversation for the top five best shows of all time. And I disagree. I think it's a really good show that I thoroughly enjoyed watching. Big thumbs up for me. Love the show. But I don't rank it that high. Um, so for me, I'll, I'll go Game of Thrones, even though I'm not the world's biggest Game of Thrones fan either. I like Game of Thrones. I'm not the world's biggest Game of Thrones fan. So they're very close to me. I'll go Game of Thrones. Uh, Hector Riaz writes, never been on the edge of my seat through a whole movie until I watched A Quiet Place. No kidding, right? Just amazing. Like, I am just basically running out of ways um, this week to talk about how great A Quiet Place is. Like, seriously, it, it, it's hard to get over and it's hard to imagine just how good that movie is. And if you have not seen it yet, you got to get yourself out to see it because it really is. It's edge of your seat the whole time. It's fantastic. Uh, number Thor writes, best vampire movie uh, in your thoughts. I love the original uh, Nosferatu solid movie and also the Gary Oldman Dracula. Uh, what's your best vampire movie? Whenever I think of the Gary Oldman Dracula, all I can think of is Keanu Reeves' terrible accent. Just brutal accent in that movie. And I'm a big Keanu Reeves fan, but his accent work in that movie is terrible. Um, I'd have to think about it, but my first reaction is to say Kiefer Sutherland's Lost Boys. I love the Lost Boys. So, yeah, I'm going to go Lost Boys on that one. I mean, I, I, maybe I'll think about it later and think, oh, my God, I totally forgot about this movie. But off the top of my head, I'm going to go Lost Boys. All right, let's move on. Lord of the Long Box writes, would you be a guest on my YouTube live show via Skype to talk about comic book movies? No, sorry about that, man. But the reality is I, I honestly get requests to do people's podcasts and YouTube shows and whatever at like four or five a week. And so the, and honestly, it's, it is really a situation of, um, if I did do yours, then I'm going to feel like I'm offending people when I turn down theirs. Cause they go, well, you did this other guy's show. And I, I simply don't have time to do that. I mean, if I got asked like once a year to do somebody's show, yeah, I would probably do it. No problem. But the, the reality is it really is that old cliche of if I do one, I kind of got to do them all. Um, and there's a part of me that wishes I really could, but the reality is if I do, then it's gonna kill my time. And, and, and I just can't do that. And I don't wanna offend anybody by doing some people's shows and not doing other people's shows. You know what I'm saying? It, it just, it puts me in a really precarious position that I'm very uncomfortable with. Um, so unfortunately, I'm super honored that you would ask. Like, believe me, I'm not just paying a lip service either. I am super honored that you would ask. But the reality is if I did, then I either got to do everybody's shows or I'm going to start offending people when they can just point to your show and say, well, see, you did it. Why won't you do mine? Why do you do this? What's wrong with me? What did I do wrong? You know, and I just, I don't, I don't want to be in that situation. I mean, it makes me cringe just feeling like I'm offending people. Ah, I don't mind offending people with my opinions. If my opinion offends you, <laughs> too bad. Uh, but I mean, I hate feeling like I'm offending people, feeling like I'm slighting them. I, I never like to feel like I'm offending people. So anyway, sorry about that. But thank you for asking. I am truly honored. Uh, Luna Comics writes, I have a confession. The cloud villain in Green Lantern terrifies me. Sucking souls and being made of their skeletons just terrified me. Uh, but ask you what, but ask you what comic movie villain ever scared you? Um... And by the way, don't apologize for that. And it's not a confession. If you like the, the villain in uh, Green Lantern, so be it. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, a villain in a combo movie that's like legit scared me. Um, I don't know. I mean, there's some great combo villains that if I were to encounter them in real life, I'd be terrified. But that, that actually scared me in the theater? I don't know. I, I don't know that that's ever happened. Um, yeah, I, I guess I don't know that's ever happened. I, I can think of some great movie villains that are fantastic and terrifying movie villains, but that actually made me feel terrified sitting in the theater. I don't think I have, honestly. But maybe if I think about it more, I'll come up with one. Uh, let's see, Spencer Smothers writes, have you ever had an actor recognize you while you were out with friends and those friends being surprised that the actor knew you? Yes, that has actually happened to me probably two or three times, but the best one wasn't me. Um, the best one, and I'm feeling really dumb right now because I totally forgot his name. Um, also, uh, uh, the best one was Anne. So here's the story. So I had um, uh, Vince Vaughn 
and Chris Pratt come to my studio and hang out for an evening uh, in my studio. To, number one, to do an interview with me because they had a movie coming out together called The Delivery Man, I believe was the name of the movie. Anyway, they then also spent the next like couple of hours there because they asked if they could use my office since they were there anyway to do this live Twitter Q&A thing that they were doing. I said, sure. So we just hung out for a couple hours in my office. It was great. And they were Chris Pratt. It was my first time meeting Chris Pratt uh, and also my first time meeting Vince Vaughn. Both of them couldn't have been nicer. Like, honestly, they were very gracious. Uh, they were great guests being in there and they were super fun and engaging, just hung out and talked to us and all that kind of stuff. And Anne was there too. And um, Anne really enjoyed hanging out and got her picture taken with Chris and got her picture taken with Vince and all that kind of stuff. So fast forward now a couple of years. Anne is at this, she, she now works at Hasbro and Hasbro was doing like this uh, work day out of office, like this off location work day at this hotel in this nice hotel somewhere in the LA area. I can't remember where, somewhere near the coast, I'm sure. And she's walking through the um, lobby of this big grand hotel thing with a bunch of people from work from Hasbro and Vince Vaughn comes up to her and says, hey, Anne, goes up to her and, and she and talks to Anne for a little bit. And ever since that happened, like, all the people at Hasbro think thinks Anne rubs shoulders with the stars all the time. They think she's like, oh, all the celebrities know Anne just because ran into Vince Vaughn and Vince Vaughn came over to her in the lobby and said, hey, Anne, and started talking to her. That's really how, how great. And you know, it's funny because I hear some people tell some really weird stories about Vince Vaughn. All I can say is uh, my experience and clearly Anne's experience have never been anything but great with Vince Vaughn. And so that's the, the coolest of those stories is Anne's story, not mine. So there, there you go. Just sharing that with you. Okay, let's move on now. Uh, next one comes to us from Ben Rayner, who writes, what's something a character has done that you felt would never have done in seasons past? Mine is the Jim storyline in the final season of The Office. Um, hard to say, uh, Ben. Honestly, I, I don't even know what it is you're talking about about what, like, I, I don't know what you're talking about when you say what Jim did in the final season of The Office. I can't remember what Jim did in the final season of The Office. Um, but beyond that, I, I mean, I don't know. That's a that's a deep cut question. Like, I'd have to sit down and think about that uh, for a long time. Like, that's a long pondering thing about something a character did in a show that I've watched long enough that what the character did in a latter season was something I felt the character would not have done in an earlier season. It's a tough question. It's a, it's a great topic, but it's, it's not something I can answer off the top of my head, unfortunately. Um, okay, uh, Jamil Taylor writes, in your opinion, best son's character? Uh, no wrong answers. Well, well Ope, Ope was my favorite character. Um, up to a point. I mean, because obviously he doesn't last... Uh, for the entire series. Um, Bobby was great. Chibs was great. Um, it's hard not to love Tiggy. Tig was such a great character. And because he was, there was darkness in him, but there was softness in him too. Um, that I, there, there was something so special about that as a character. You know what I mean? And to the point, he was such a weird character that I think my favorite line in all of Sons of Anarchy is when uh, Jax, he is in Ireland, and him and this girl in Ireland are getting kind of close, and they are about to have sex, and I think it was one of their mothers breaks in and reveals they're, they're actually half-brother, half-sister. So they stop themselves. So Jax is talking to like, I think Chibs or somebody later and goes, man, I almost went full Tig on that. Which just, if you know the Tig character, if you know Tiggy, you would laugh your ass off, right? Um, so, ah, oh, man, I don't know. Ope, Chib, Tig, Bobby, Opie. Uh, I, I mean, Ope, I mean, I mean, Clay is great. The mom's great. I, I mean, it's hard to say. It's really hard to say. I'm gonna. I'll say Ope overall, probably Ope. But Tig, man, Tig is a tough one. Tig is a tough one to pass up. Uh, Darth Impact writes, "Hey John, I watched Vibrant Com I watched Vibrant Comics on YouTube. He did a Who is Marvel's Ronin video. His theory 
Uh, the reason Hawkeye isn't in any trailers is because he's going to become the character Ronan to protect his family. Yeah, but he's, he's not becoming something else. He just takes on... I mean, all it really is is a, it's a different costume and he calls himself a different name. It's still the same guy. It's still Barton. Um, and maybe, I mean, there is a legit reason to think maybe the reason that they're not showing us him is because he does don a different outfit. He's no longer donning the Hawkeye outfit. Maybe he's, he's taking on a different persona. Maybe, maybe, I guess. Is that really such a big series? Because nobody, 99% of the people going to go into the movie theaters to watch us know anything about Ronan or would have any concept of there being any significance to a costume change in him. So I... There's good reason to think that, but I think there's also good reason to not. I'm not sure which way I'm leaning on it. I'm going to guess no, but it's a very valid theory that has some very valid facts supporting it as a theory. So I'm sure we'll find out. We're less than two weeks away. <laughs> less than two weeks away from me being able to see it. I'm super stoked about that. Um, Anthony R. writes, In the Nolan movie, a Bruce trained... Uh, I guess you didn't mean to put the A in there. In the Nolan movie, Bruce trained from age 22 to 29, but in the comics, he trained from 12 to 25. Did Nolan think a kid Bruce traveling the world was unrealistic? Kid Bruce in Gotham is already doing stuff. Uh, I don't know if Nolan was thinking anything about that. I, I think Nolan was just thinking that was probably showing background with him and, and, the, um, um, and the Rachel character, and for that to have weight... They had to have a relationship, like a relationship of some sorts, at least into his young adult life, rather than just that as a kid uh, before taking off. So that's probably his reasoning. Other than that, I'm not really sure. I've never heard um, Christopher Nolan talk about that or his rationale or his reasoning behind having Bruce leave when Bruce leaves. But it would seem to me that he was trying to set up a firmer connections to him as a more as a young adult than just those of a child, so that when he comes back, the Rachel thing is a big deal to him. That's my guess. I could be way off on that, but but that is my guess. Interesting observation, Anthony. All right. Next one comes to us from Reginald Kelly, who writes, Do you think Storm will get more time to shine in Dark Phoenix? She's always underused in other films. Well, I mean, it, it depends. The, the characters are there to serve the story. You don't write the story to serve a character. The characters are there to serve a story. Whether or not they plan on using Storm more in this movie than others, don't know. I mean, a lot of people think they underused uh, Cyclops. I'm one of the people who thinks they've always underused Cyclops and misused Cyclops. But the more screen time you give to one character means you've got to take screen time away from another character. And it's, it's a balancing act. So whether or not they'll go more on Storm, I'm not seeing any indication to make me think they're going to give more screen time to Storm this time around. Uh, they might. They totally might. I'm just saying at this very early juncture, I haven't seen anything that would suggest to me that she's going to get more screen time than before. So who knows? We're going to have to wait and see. Uh, Mr. J writes, The Accountant 2 will have that will have that John Wick effect. I, I don't know what you're talking about. When you say, I don't know what you mean by John, what do you mean John Wick effect? I, you'd have to be a little bit more thorough <laughs> in that, Mr. J. Um, I'm excited to talk about The Accountant 2, and I'm always excited to talk about John Wick, but I have no idea what you mean by The Accountant 2 will have that John Wick effect. I can't address it because I'm not really quite sure what it is we're talking about. Uh, Adil Hassan writes, Hi, John. I want to see Nick Fury in Infinity War. Do you? Nah. I love Nick Fury, but I don't need him to be in Infinity War. He's going to be in Captain Marvel. I mean, we already have 7,328 characters in Avengers Infinity War. Like, what, what's he going to do? He's going to show up for three seconds and say, Hi, guys, I'm going out for burgers. Boom. And then he's gone. Because that's really all the time you have left for. I mean, I always get, I'm getting people all the time writing me, I want to see this guy in Infinity War and this guy in Infinity War. And I'm like, there's already 85 characters in there. Like, at some point, you just got to say enough. So, as far as I know, um, Samuel Jackson has said he's not in the film. As far as I know, he's not in the film. And no, the last thing I want, understanding that one of my concerns about this movie is that it's going to feel too convoluted because there might be too many characters, the last thing I want them is to add yet another character. It's only a two and a half hour movie, so uh, just, yeah, not so sure. Uh, Kenneth Collins writes, you're a class act, John. Oh, thank you, Kenneth. I appreciate that. Thank you so much for writing that in. Uh, ZCM Zombie writes, one of my favorite quotes from you was, 
in the name of good, oh yeah, I used to say that a lot. Like, when I would say about something that I want, I'd say, in the name of all that is good, <laughs> like I would say that a lot. I've never had somebody mention to me that they like that as a quote, but thank you, ZCM, I appreciate you for saying that, thanks. Uh, Lori Scott writes, if you haven't seen it, check out Housebound. I've never heard of it, to be honest. Scary but funny movie with a good Kiwi boy, uh, Gerard Johnstone. It's fantastic. I have never heard of it. Um, do me a favor, Lori. F uh, fire me off an email and let me know, um, is that something that's just in theaters now where you are? Or is that now on Netflix or Amazon? Or Let me know where I might be able to find it so I can at least get some more information on it. Thank you. Uh, Nathan C. writes, uh, they'd only CGI out the Mind Stone for Vision spoiler. I'm not exactly what the context of that conversation is, Nathan, but okay. Um, Joshua Stevens writes, Supernatural is the best TV show of all time. Well, you know I love Supernatural. I would not call it the greatest show of all time, but I certainly do appreciate the show, and I love the show. I love the Scooby Natural episode. Um... I've loved so many of the characters. Crowley was one of my favorite television characters, like in all of television for a long time. Uh, I love Castiel. I loved Bobby. I mean, I just love all the characters they throw in there. Um, of course, Tiffany Smith was on the show recently, which is great. Um, but yeah, my three favorite shows of all time are, are uh, in no, no particular order, though, Battlestar Galactica, the Ronald Moore one is, is my all-time favorite. And then in no particular order, Spartacus, Sons of Anarchy. Um, but Supernatural will probably be in my top 10. I, I, I'm just a sucker for this show. I absolutely love that show. Uh, Muse Tech Reviews writes, Thoughts on the first Purge trailer? You a fan? I, I wasn't blown away by the first Purge trailer. I wasn't. Because I think I mentioned this on the show the other day. Um, there's a new Purge movie coming out called The First Purge. And really, it's just a bunch of clips from the other Purge movies, and then just a bunch of random scenes from this new movie that just make it look like another Purge movie. I, I mean, honestly, I'm watching, it's like, okay, it's, it's definitely a Purge movie, but it, there is nothing unique to it from my perspective. So um, there are Purge movies I have liked. I certainly didn't like the last one. I thought the last one was a complete waste. One or two of them have been pretty good. So, I don't know that I call myself a big fan of the franchise at this point, but I'm certainly open to seeing them. But yeah, that first trailer, I'll be honest with you, for this new one didn't really do anything for me yet. Okay, next one. Lori Scott writes, Ever found you were sitting next to somebody famous at a movie? Uh, your early screenings slash premieres don't count. It happened to me when I saw The Hobbit. Um, not counting press screenings or premieres. Ooh, I, I might kick myself later for saying I don't remember, but I don't remember. Uh, who knows, maybe later tonight I'll be laying in bed going, oh, I totally forgot about this time. But uh, off the top of my head, I mean, I can list off a million times at press screenings or at, um, or at premieres, but actually just, just at an average movie night out, finding myself sitting next to somebody famous, I, off the top of my head, I can't think of it. Off the top of my head, I can't think of it. Um, good question though. Nathan C writes, also Mjolnir broke in an alley in the trailers. The shots are the same as the movie. Only the green screen background changed. I see everyone's point. Um, I don't recall that, but maybe, uh, maybe it seems like a pointless thing for them to do. Um, but maybe that is the case. I, again, I, I don't remember what it was in the trailer. But again, that, that doesn't materially change anything. It doesn't change anything about our perception of the movie or the or what happened in the movie at all. So if, if you're right, and I've got no reason to believe that you're not right, but if you're right, I don't really see what the point of doing that was because it doesn't change anything. Uh, I don't know, who knows? Uh, MuseTac Reviews writes, Krypton still working out for you? Yeah, it is actually. Um, it's funny because I, I, I watched episode one and then I didn't keep up with the next two episodes but I binged them yesterday, the following two episodes. And yeah, yeah, I'm still on board. And what I really like about it is they are not making it a Superman show. Yes, the Superman is kind of a MacGuffin in the show. Like he's the reason this is all happening, the cape of Superman that is slowly disappearing as they're running out of time. Because when Superman's cape disappears, that means they're out of time to change the future. 
and it's a great little device. But other than that, and the odd mention of him, it's not a Superman show. And you know, I was just kind of criticizing Gotham a little bit that, hey, Gotham is at its best when it's a Jim Gordon show, not a, look, it's little baby Batman. Like when they do that, it loses me. And they are really keeping this, this is a show about Seg L. And this is a show about the house of L and Krypton and Brainiac and stuff like that. And it seems like they're keeping their focus there. And as such, I'm, in, I'm into it. Uh, I, it's not like the greatest show on TV, but I'm enjoying it. I'm having a good time with it. Uh, let's see. Uh, Luke JNGS writes, how about those Sedin twins? Yeah, amazing last night, uh, last home game. Great atmosphere. Go Canucks, go. For those of you who don't know anything about hockey, and get civilized, you savages. <laughs> um, for those of you who don't know anything about hockey, um, the Sedin twins were these two highly touted twins. Uh, uh, why am I forgetting the one? It's it's Henrik and... What's Henrik's brother's name? Why am I freezing on Henrik's brother's name? Um, uh, is it Daniel and Henrik? Why am I forgetting the Henrik twins' names? Um... Yeah, it is Daniel and Hendrick. Why did I freeze on that? It's Daniel and Hendrick. So these two twins, uh, come on. So you think there's a novelty there, right? And they get drafted by the same team. The Vancouver Canucks draft this, the Sedin twins. And you think that's a novelty factor. They just ended their 17-year career. And they ended as the number one and number two all-time scorers on the Vancouver Canucks. The Vancouver Canucks, a celebrated franchise in the NHL, and they finish, one brother finishes the all-time goal scoring leader for the Canucks, the other brother, the all-time assist leader for the Canucks, and together they are the number one and number two overall point scoring leaders in franchise history. Crazy. You couldn't write a movie like that. The movie would seem unbelievable. Um, so I remember when I heard that they were retiring, first of all, they had a long career, man, 17 seasons. They played, and they're still playing top notch. And in their final home game, they scored the overtime goal. One of the brothers scored the overtime goal. The other brother assisted on it. Perfect, perfect storybook ending, right? Uh, it's a shame they didn't get into the playoffs in their final season, but still, what a career. Um, yeah, just just amazing. Uh, Hall of Fame for both of them. Like when you finish number one, number two, all-time scoring leaders on your franchise, you got to get into the Hall of Fame. So that's what I'm thinking. Uh, let's see. Next one comes to us from Ara Olson, who writes, uh, uh, completely coincidentally, also about the Sedin twins. Hey, John, do you think the Sedin brothers deserve to be voted into the NHL Hall of Fame? 17 slash 18 seasons, 1,000 plus points and 1,300 plus games. That's huge. Look, to me, all you've got to say is they finished one and two as the all time scoring leader of their franchise. That's to me, that's all you got to say to just, you know, take a broom, brush off the welcome mat to the Hall of Fame and usher them right in. When you finish your career as the top scorer in the history of a celebrated franchise like the Vancouver Canucks, then yeah, you're damn right. You get escorted into the Hall of Fame. Um, so yeah, I, I think both of these guys de deserve to be and should be in the Hall of Fame for sure. Uh, Dave Akins writes, do you prefer Sonic or Mario? I'm a Nintendo guy between, you know, Sega and um, and Mar and uh, Nintendo. I'll go Nintendo. Definitely played a lot more Mario. I still play more Mario. Uh, Chris Martin writes, if a movie flops, what happens with the investors that put their money into the film? They lose their money. I mean, that's no, no magical money fairy comes out of the woodwork to give them their money back or to mitigate their losses. That's why I always say, like, when people say, well, if a movie does well, actors should be given big bonuses. I always go, why? Are the actors going to give their, their salary back if the movie flops? Like, seriously, I, that's that's what we always, I always feel about it. It's like when people say, like, I always get these discussions with people. It's like, that movie made that much money and that actor only got like $500,000. He should get a bonus. They should give him like another million dollars. And I always follow that up with, um, well, most movies don't make money. Um, and if that movie lost money, should that actor give money back? No, you shouldn't touch their money. Well, if you're not risking money, you shouldn't. Those who risk are the ones who should get the reward. That's that's always kind of been my theory on this kind of stuff. Is those who have the risk are the ones who should reap the reward. 
Now, like, yeah, sometimes actors have clauses in their contracts that they get, you know, points on the movie and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But for the most part, you know, an actor signs up to be in a movie, they, they sign the contract, they get their fee plus a residual, sure, blah, 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 and that's the way it is. They don't lose, they're guaranteed that money. They get paid that money whether that movie makes $100 million or loses $100 million. That actor gets their money. The people who make the movie possible the people who finance these things, where it's the studio and other financiers as well, yeah, uh, the, the, these, um, uh, these funds that go in there and put money in, that movie doesn't make any money, they lose their money. The money's gone, bye-bye, they lose their money. Um, and I remember I produced a film once, and so I went into this log book, right? Basically, so after I produced this film, I had so many independent filmmakers contacting me, asking me if I'd like to be a producer. What they were really asking me is if I wanted to put money into their indie film. You know, asking me, hey, you know, we need a $20,000 investment and blah, blah, blah. It's not like I had $20,000 ever in my bank account, but they'd be like, we need a $20,000 investment to, you know, do the post-production, finish up post-production on this, and we'll give you an executive producer credit, and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, and I started getting like five or six of those emails a week from different people. Everybody wants your money because they know they're never going to get the money back on it. And, and so, and it, but yeah, people who put up money for movies that lose money, they lose their money. That's, that's kind of what happens. I'm sure there are exceptions, but generally speaking, uh, Sean Don writes, Hey John, given that you're really into tech, I was wondering if you had a favorite pair of headphones that you would recommend below $200. Um, honestly, I have one really good set of headphones, and that's my Bose, uh, uh, what's the actual, Bose Quiet, anyway, they're Bluetooth noise canceling headphones, and they're marvelous, and I paid like 300 bucks for them. It's the only time in my life I've spent over 50 bucks on a set of headphones, because to me, I've never really cared that much about headphones um, all that much. You know, you put them on your ears, they give you your sound. I paid extra for the bows because a friend of mine had the same pair and I fell in love with them. So I went and bought them myself. I use this uh, pair of headphones. Uh, what are they called here? They're called the Superlux uh, headphones. And I'll be honest with you, these came free. I bought an Atomos uh, uh, Flame. An Atomos Flame. For those of you who know, don't know, an Atomos Flame is a, uh, is a monitor it's a production monitor that's also a hard drive recorder. So you plug your camera into this thing and you can preview a gorgeous monitor, but it also records in ProRes and in the Avid codec as well. So it actually also records all your files. It's a great device, but it came with these headphones and I like them, so I just started using them. Again, they can't be that expensive. So I, I'm the wrong person to ask because to me, headphones are headphones. The only headphones that I have that I really like that I'm really proud of that I have and that I kind of cherish that I have are those Bose uh, Bluetooth noise canceling headphones. To me, those are amazing. I love those things, uh, but it's the only one I can really recommend it. But unfortunately those are over $200. Like they're in the $300 range, but I can't recommend them enough. Like they are marvelous. If you can stretch a little bit more, maybe hop on Craigslist and look for a pair, maybe uh, so, like a used, but I, I honestly, I cannot recommend these headphones enough. The sound is great and the, they're super comfortable. I often have a problem with comfortable with headphones being comfortable. These things are super comfortable. They sound great. The noise reduction is fantastic. Can't say enough good things about them, man. Can't say enough good things about them. Okay, let's move on here. Maxwell N writes, Hey John, big fan. Will Black Lightning cross over with the other Arrowverse shows next year? Well, here's the thing. They always said, and by the way, I'm loving Black Lightning. I love this show. They said from the beginning, they were being very ambiguous about whether or not the Black Lightning character lives in the same universe as the rest of the Arrowverse. But then around like episode seven or something like that, it was either episode seven, episode eight, somewhere around there, they actually name reference Vixen, who is a character in the Arrowverse. And they mentioned Vixen by name. And that kind of did it. I mean, that kind of signal, yep, it's in the same universe. It's in the same universe. So uh, I think it's possible. Yeah, you could see a crossover or two come next year. It'll be a little strange because Black Lightning feels pretty different from like Arrow and Flash feel very much, they're different shows, but they have very much the same tone. 
Black Lightning's a different tone of a show. So it's going to be interesting to see how they cross them over. But yeah, I believe you're going to see them cross over at some point next year. All right, let's move on now to the next question. The next one comes to us from ZCM Zombie, who writes, Thoughts on Talk Radio Movie by Oliver Stone, the one with Alec Baldwin? Um, boy, that's a deep cut. That's going back a while. And if, if I remember correctly, too, one of my other favorite guys on TV of all time was John C. McGinley. He was in Office Space as, what would you say you do here but he was also a great character on scrubs as well uh, i was good i think it was a little bit ahead it was a project of its time but i think it's kind of a movie that would also do well right now but instead of talking about talk radio talking about like online podcasts and live youtube shows might fill in better but honestly not that memorable to me to be honest with you uh seed starter seven writes what did you think of the hunter with willem dafoe uh, a slow paced but such a beautiful movie how is Defoe not a leading man in more films? Well, um, Hunter, again, pretty good. Didn't love it. Uh, where he's like on the hunt for, oh, what was it? He's like hunting, the, He's he's been hired to hunt the, like the last of this species. And I can't remember what the species was that he sent in to hunt. But why isn't he a leading man more? Well, the fact of the matter is, and, and this is an unfortunate reality, is that Defoe's in his 60s now. And there's not a lot of movies being written for 60 plus year old leading men. I, I mean, and that's that's just always been the case in Hollywood for the most part. There are some exceptions, yes, but for the most part, there's not a whole slew of movies written with 60 plus year old actors in the lead. Um, so there there are there are roles out there, but not like the big lead roles and stuff like that, at least not a lot of them. And again, the actor is there to serve the character and the character is there to serve the movie. So you don't write a movie around Willem Dafoe, though I'm sure somebody would, uh, but that's part of reality. So, but hey, there are still clearly roles for him and when he does them, he crushes them and that's all that really matters. Uh, let's see, Connor Diaz writes, the iPod scene in A Quiet Place is so sweet. It really is. See, and that that's a great scene that highlights the brilliance of A Quiet Place, is that it's not just a movie of raw monsters. No, it's great moments of connection and emotion. And you're right, in the sea of this movie, they throw in there this seemingly out of place scene that is so beautifully fits in was the iPod scene. And I'm not gonna talk about what the iPod scene is because I know a lot of you guys haven't seen it, but the iPods, you'll know it when it comes up. The iPod scene is great. Uh, Dan Irwin writes, hey John, do you like the Graham, and, Graham Norton show? You know, I've seen clips of the Graham Norton show, like it's a talk show online, but I don't live in the UK. I've never really watched it. So I cannot say I'm a fan or I'm not a fan. I know every once in a while I see clips from special interviews he does and they, they're always usually pretty good, but I haven't watched the show to either say I am or am not a fan of it. Um, let's see, Dren Chin writes, what do you think of the latest AIF TV, oh, uh, Infinity War channel? I, the, you're like the 50th guy to ask me, what do you think of the new TV spot for Infinity War? Did you see all those stones in the glove? I, I, yeah, I saw it. And I'll tell you exactly what I've said the other 20 times people have asked me. I saw it. It's a good trailer. To be honest with you, it's starting to feel like all the, they're all starting to feel the same to me, which is not necessarily a bad thing. It means they're not giving too awful much away in the trailers, but they are all starting to feel the same to me at this point. So uh, yeah, I saw it, liked it. Uh, nothing more to say beyond that, really. Uh, Dan Irwin writes, I'd recommend playing the Assassin's Creed games. Some are so full of brilliant storylines, action, characters, and world building. Yeah, I've actually played, I played the first Assassin's Creed game. I haven't played any since then. I've watched a buddy of mine play a couple of them and they look like a lot of fun. So I don't have a lot of time to get caught up on old games, unfortunately, but uh, Assassin's Creed has always been a title. I thought, you know, when I've got like three months to relax and I'm gonna play a number of games, Assassin's Creed is definitely one of the, the games that are on my list. Lorenzo Calderon writes, Hey John, I love all the work you do and keep it up. Thank you so much, Lorenzo. So real quick, have you seen any promotions of Ant-Man for Infinity War? Is he in the movie? He's in the movie. We know that. We know Ant-Man is in the movie. But no, other than some magazine covers, he has not showed up on any of the official marketing. Both Ant-Man and the Wasp have been on a couple of early magazine covers for Infinity War, but they're not included in any of the marketing. All I can assume at this point, and I could be right, could be wrong, but all we can assume at this point is that 
so much of what they're doing in the movie will give away something in Ant-Man and the Wasp that's coming in a few months. So that's the only thing I can assume at this point. But uh, from everything I understand, yes, they are in the movie, but nope, I haven't seen them in any of the marketing either. Them and uh, Hawkeye are just very dubiously absent from all the official marketing and all the posters and everything like that. Uh, Krieger119 writes, Watch The Quiet Place again, but in Dolby. OMFG, that's a must. Yeah, the, seriously, man, that's one of the reasons why I love the AMC Prime Theater so much is because they got that Dolby Atmos sound system, which is always good. But it's particularly good when you're going in for a movie like The Quiet Place where the sound is such an important element of the movie. I, I sound is an important element of every movie, but especially for a movie like Quiet Place. Uh, R. O. Olson writes, did you see the Infinity TV spot chant? Here we go again. On Facebook and Twitter, in different aspect ratio, you can see the Soul Stone or Mind Stone. Which one do you think? I don't care. I mentioned this on the John Campy show, or it might have been on Open Mic earlier today. I don't care about, in this shot, there's this many Infinity Stones, and in that shot, there's that many Infinity Stones. And that's cool. If, you, if you're really into that, and you're keeping track, and you're charting that, that's great. That's one of the fun things about being a film fan. For me, I simply do not care. Don't give a shit about any of that. And the reason I don't care is because every one of these shots that we see, whether it's the Cap holding Thanos' hand when it's just got two stones in it, whether it's him coming through this portal and there seems to be more stones in it, I don't care because we don't know the context of any of those shots. We don't know when in the movie any of those shots happen. We don't know the context in which those shots are happening. Therefore, how many stones are or aren't in the Infinity Glove is completely pointless without context. Since that's the case, I decided a long time ago that I don't care. I don't care where the Soul Stone is. I don't care how many stones are or aren't in his gauntlet at this particular time or that particular time or that particular time. I just really don't care because there's no point in worrying about it unless we have context to what those shots are and we simply don't have context, nor should we at this point. So I'm digging the trailers, but as far as the whole back and forth thing and the guessing game of which stones are in there and which stones are, I really don't care. I just, I simply do not care. And it's cool if you do, and it's cool. I know a lot of people do. And if you're having fun following along with that, awesome. Don't let me dissuade you at all. I'm just saying for me, I just don't give a shit. And, uh, and that's why I don't care. Uh, Akeem writes, uh, where'd he go? Akeem writes, went into a quiet place for a good monster movie, left captivated by a family movie with monsters. Love this flick. And man, you, you, that's a great way to put it, Akeem. You go in thinking you're going in for one movie and you get that, but you find out there are other elements that so far supersede what you went in for. It's just one of those really special movie going experiences. Like I said earlier, I'm running out of ways to describe just how great this movie is. Uh, Kaylee E.Q. writes, um, on reserve seating, my closest theater doesn't have it. That sucks. As such, I drive 30 minutes to go to one that does have it. Damn right. Uh, if that was or is the case near you, would you? Well, it all depends. Like, if I'm going to go see Black Panther for the fifth time or sixth time or seventh time, whatever, in its sixth week of release, then I don't need to go to the reserve theater seating theater because I know there's going to be tons and tons of empty seats. I don't need to worry about it. I can just go in and there's not going to be a problem. If it's the first week that Infinity War is playing, like on day seven or something like that, then yeah, I'm driving the extra 30 minutes because I got my reserve seat. I'm more than willing to give up that 30 minutes of driving so I don't have to spend an hour and a half standing in line just to make sure I get a half decent seat. That's archaic. I mean, that's from the dark ages, that way of doing things. So yeah, I would drive the extra 30 minutes, but again, but if it's for a movie that no one's seeing or it's already been out for three or four weeks, then I would go to the closer one because it doesn't really matter all that much that I have the reserve spot. Um, okay, next one. Randy Miller writes, John, my first D-Box movie experience will be A Quiet Place on Tuesday night. What do you think of D-Box vibrating seats? Will it add to the horror movie and thrills? You know, somebody asked me a very similar question to this uh, a while ago. I have never been, I've never experienced a D-Box. I've never been in a theater that happened to have them or lived near one that I thought, oh, it'd just be convenient for me to go in there and check it out. So 
I can't say. I, I've heard some pretty good things about the D-Box experience. Yeah, I've heard some people say some okay things about it. But just myself, uh, I've never had the pleasure. Never had the pleasure, so I can't really. But do me a favor, Randy. Email or jump into the comments section after you've done it and let us know what did it add to the experience for you. Let me know what you think. Okay. Uh, Kayla. EQ2 writes, suggestion for Hot Toys, life-size Baby Groot. Oh, I have I was very tempted to buy that one-to-one -one scale Baby Groot. I was really tempted to buy it. I've been tempted to buy that one on a number of occasions. It's an absolutely adorable. If you haven't seen it, look up Hot Toys, one-to-one -one ratio, uh, Baby Groot scale, and tell me you're not tempted to drop the money to buy it. It's absolutely adorable. It's a lot of money but it's absolutely adorable. Uh, Clock Penalty writes, you said that Iris West seemed unqualified to leave a team of scientists as she's just a journalist, but in episode one, she's finishing her PhD in psychology. <laughs> so what? Um, does that move the needle for you at all, knowing she's also, P no, no. And she's not a PhD. She's not Dr. Iris West. She never finishes. She, so she's not Dr. Iris West. And even if she was, that again, you got to, this is a science action hero team. She is the least qualified of any of the scientists. She's the least qualified for field battle experience. And she's the least qualified in terms of superpowers. You got four people on the team with superpowers. You got a couple people on this team or th at minimum three, four people on this team that are science geniuses. In comes Iris. I worked at a newspaper. I'm going to be your leader. How about that? Not the superhero, not the guy who this whole team is named after, Flash, not Cisco, who both has interdimensional teleportation powers and is a brilliant scientist, not, you know, Killer Frost, who has the remarkable superpowers of the gods and is like one of the world's foremost scientists, not this Wells guy who's even smarter than everybody else on the team. No, me, I worked as, I run a blog. Make me your leader. That is so dumb. It's the dumbest thing. It's almost as dumb as Arrow making Captain Buckles uh, uh, Black Canary. It's almost as, not quite as dumb. It's not as dumb, but it's almost as dumb. It's like, it's almost like they were so desperate to give her a place on the show. And I was really liking the character. I was really loving the Iris character. And there's still much about the Iris character that I love for sure. But that felt so forced and it is. It's so forced, so unnatural, so shoehorned. Well, you did run a blog. Seems like you're the person to be the leader of Team Flash. Fucking stupid. So stupid. And maybe one of the reasons why I just don't have the same passion for, for the Flash. When a show starts doing really stupid things... It can't help but zap some of my enthusiasm for the show. And, and The Flash has been my favorite show on, um, on this, out of all the CW shows for a while. It's been like one of my favorites for a while. But I'm telling you, I've been starting to lose my enthusiasm for it. I'm not saying I'm done with it, not at all. But I am losing my enthusiasm and really stupid moves like, Hey, you, you worked in a newspaper. You know nothing about science, you have no superpowers, you certainly have no field combat experience, but why don't we make you the boss? It's one of the most ridiculous things I've ever done. Anyway, and the fact that she was going studying for, for a psychology degree does not change that for me at all. Uh, ZCM writes, best Michael Mann movie, Heat, Collateral, uh, Blast the Mohicans. I'm going to go Heat. Heat for me is, uh, Collateral's really underrated, by the way. But uh, I'll go Heat. Heat seems to be the one to go with. Uh, Phil Lee writes, Arrowverse problems. Oliver fought off aliens and got thanks from the president. Fought off Nazis from another Earth. FBI still hunts him for killing mobsters. Hey, guess what? I mean, that's, that's actually not a problem, Phil. Because even in the real world, if some dude cured cancer and would be the ultimate hero the world has ever known but they found out they murdered somebody illegally, they would go to jail. I, I mean, that's kind of real. So I don't know that that's a problem. Like, hey, you did something, you were a hero and you're great, but you broke the law and murdered people? We, you don't get a pass. So I'm actually gonna go out on a limb. I've got 
several problems, Phil, with the Arrowverse. I have several issues with the Arrowverse, but I gotta say, I don't think that's one of them because I actually believe if that were real life, that's how it would also happen in real life. doesn't matter how big of a hero you are. You, you find out you murdered somebody or did some really back, you break the law, they're gonna put you in jail. I mean, so I, I don't think that's a problem with it. I have several other problems that you and I can probably agree on, but that's probably not one I, I see as a problem. Uh, let's see. Mary writes, Civil War made a billion, so Black Panther is fifth. Oh, as in the fifth? Um, I have five films in the MCU made a billion dollars. I'm not totally sure about that. Hold on a second. Let me, let me pull this up. Uh, I'm going to go over to the fateful box office mojo. Go to the all-time box office stuff. And we're going to see in the Billion Dollar Club how many MCU movies. Uh... No, 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 Skyfall, Lord of the Rings, Transformers, Captain America, Civil War, made 1.1, 1. 1. Um, Black Panther, Avengers of Age of Ultron, and uh, The Avengers. So there are four films, Black Panther, Age of, Ult or Age of Ultron, The First Avengers, and Captain America, Civil War are the four MCU films that have broken the $1 billion mark. I'm just double checking the numbers right now. Yes, that's it. Um, the next closest one MCU film that came close to breaking the billion dollar mark was Spider-Man Homecoming at $880 million, but that fell well short. So there have been four films uh, of the MCU that have, um, uh, that have uh, joined the billion dollar club. Okay, Toby Miller writes, Black Panther is still in the top five box office with Infinity War. You know, somebody asked me a question earlier today asking, could Black Panther still be in the top 10? And what I said is that top 10, no doubt. I, I have no doubt that Black Panther will still be in the top 10 at the box office by the time um, Infinity War hits theaters. Top five, that's the question. I have my doubts. I actually, I, I would be very surprised if it did. It's not impossible. It's certainly not impossible, but there are a number of other, I mean, we've already seen Black Panther drop down to number four, and there are a couple of other films coming, and first of all, Quiet Place is gonna have some legs. That's ahead of it already. Um, we've got uh, uh, Ready Player One is ahead of it. Rampage is gonna be ahead of it. There are a couple of other films that are gonna get ahead of it, and Black Panther's already down at number four. In three more weeks, can it still be in the top five? It's possible but it's already down to number four, so I'm gonna say unlikely. It's unlikely, but possible, but definitely it'll still be in the top 10. Uh, ZCM Zombie writes, Dominic Trudeau versus Christian Grey, who survives from a brawl inside a helicopter that eventually crashes. Well, Christian Grey can't brawl, so I'll take, remember, anything short of Batman or Jesus, Dominic Toretto pretty much wins. He shouldn't, but he will. Dominic Toretto could fight a dump truck and Dominic Toretto will win. Somehow, a non-sentient dump truck will find a way to tap out to Dominic Toretto. Uh, but Christian Grey, yeah, no, not Christian Grey. Uh, let's see here. D. Walters writes, John, I saw your reply to that uh, FMO, oh, fuck, Mary kill question, and I just want to remind you that Tony Stark is Lord and Savior. We need one more movie with him. Somebody was asking me, okay, where this is coming from is on a show the other day, Somebody asked me, okay, you had to fuck one, that means you get three more movies. Marry one, you get one more movie. Kill one, you get no more movies out of them. And they said, Captain America, Thor, or Iron Man. And I said, you know what? I love them all, but I want at least one more Thor movie. I'd love three more Captain America movies. And even though I'd like to get more Iron Man movies, out of all of them, I can most live without Iron Man at this point. So, uh... That clearly, D. Wathers, you would answer that question differently, which is totally fair. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm going to stick with my answer for now. I'm going to stick with it. Uh, ZCM writes, a Calvin and Hobbes movie, but Hobbes from Fast and Furious. <laughs> that sounds like a great Saturday Night Live sketch. I would love to see that on Saturday Night Live. If they do a Calvin and Hobbes, but it's The Rock playing Hobbes from Fast and Furious. That would be gold. That would be the greatest Saturday Night Live sketch ever. I want to see that. Uh, okay, SS Junior Goku Black writes, will you ever do reviews for the two Batman The Telltale series seasons? Probably not. 
you know what? I sat down to watch the first one, and I, I was bored. I'll be honest, I was bored. Now, I wasn't playing it. I was only watching it. Um, and maybe playing would be a completely different experience. But honestly, just watching it, I was I was really bored. So uh, honestly, probably not. Probably won't happen. Who knows? Never say never, but probably not. Uh, ZCM writes, Brian Mills versus Dom Toretto. Who wins? Honestly, I don't know who Brian Mills is off the top of my head, so I can't even answer that question. Sorry, man. Uh, Matthew Carrera writes, That solo trailer got me so hyped for May 25th. I think uh, Alden looks and sounds great in the role. I, I think Alden looks and sounds great. Again, it's only a small sample size. The trailer is just a small sample size, so let's not get ahead of ourselves. But I have been all for, from the day they announced him as, as solo, I love the casting. Because I think he's a great actor. And I thought, what really impresses me is when an actor can stand out as a great performance in a, even a really bad movie. And Alden Ehrenreich in Hail Caesar was so good. Uh, I just loved him in that movie. So um, yeah, and this new trailer took up the excitement a notch, man. It really did. Matthew Carrera writes, A Quiet Place opened to $50 million. That's a big success for a small indie feeling movie. It really is. I mean, initially they were thinking maybe, maybe it could make 30. Then they heard the positive word, of, the, the positive buzz, and they bumped that projection up to 40, and then it comes in even higher because the word of mouth has been off the charts. The reviews and the word of mouth has been spectacular. And we did a little What We're Watching Stardust app uh, segment on my show the other day. We're just taking your guys reviews and reactions to the movie. And it's so stellar and so off the chart that yes, it's a huge success for a little film like that. Absolutely. Uh, Brandon Torres writes, Ronda Rousey killed it. Dana White showed up too. Talking about Ronda Rousey making her first appearance at WrestleMania. I watched WrestleMania the other night. It was okay, but I was so impressed because I was very skeptical about Ronda Rousey coming into the WWE. But I gotta tell you, man, she looked like she's been doing it her whole life. She looked great in her WWE, uh, WWE debut. Big, full marks to her. Uh, I was really impressed. Uh, Nick James writes, Do you know why Warner put out a two-hour mandate on Justice League? Avengers, Civil War, Dark Knight Trilogy, etc. All went over two and a half hours, so don't understand the logic. Um, no, by the way, we don't know officially. Warner Brothers never came out and officially said they did. That's been the word, but it's never been officially confirmed that that's the case. But let's assume for a second that they did. Um, that isn't what made Justice League, uh, you know, it's hard to say because I like Justice League, okay? But it didn't work for a lot of people. The runtime was not one of the problems of the film. That was a, two hours is plenty long. Two hours is plenty long. Like, I could give you a huge, and I've done it on various shows where I've run down huge lists of all these great all-time films that are less than two hours long. Like Guardians of the Galaxy, for example. For answer, let me pull this up here quickly. Uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. The Galaxy uh, runtime. Guardians of the Galaxy runtime. Two hours. You had all these characters you had to introduce that we've never... You had to introduce an entire galaxy because up at that point, MCU has always just been on Earth. You had to introduce this entire galaxy. You had to introduce Star-Lord, Gamora... Nebula, uh, Drax, Groot, Rocket, Ronin, the Collector. Uh, you had to introduce the uh, Ravagers. You had to introduce, um, like, you had to introduce everything. It was a brand new universe. All this kind of stuff. You introduce all these guys. Blah, blah, blah. And guess what? They did it in two hours, and it's spectacular. And people loved it. Why couldn't Justice League do that? Um... Yes, there are films. I think what Warner Brothers was just tired of their... Like, they were tired about how long Batman versus Superman was. It was too long. And while some people, including myself, kind of feel like the ultimate cut, which was like three hours long, um, was a little bit better of a version. Yeah, it's a little bit better of a version, but the drawback to it was way too long. If you are a good filmmaker, there is simply no excuse that you can't make a good film in two hours. There's just no excuse. Hey, if you can do, do longer, great. That's fine too. But 
Um, this whole scapegoating of the notion about two hours, because guess what? Look, if Star Wars, if the original Star Wars can be under two hours and be as good as it was, if Guardians of the Galaxy can be two hours, there's just no excuse then. There's just no excuse. This whole thing that if it was two hours and 35 minutes, would have no, no, it would have been another 35 minutes of the same stuff. And it still would have been as good or as bad as however you thought it was. I, I just don't buy this theory that it's because of how long it was. When there's plenty of examples of tons of movies that are two hours or less that has just as many characters and all that kind of stuff and being a big blockbuster films and the key is making it great. And uh, they made it great for me, but they clearly didn't make it great for a lot of other people. So, and I don't think the two hours, adding 15 more minutes wasn't gonna change the DNA of the movie. Anyway, that's just my thought. Uh, Zach Clayton Douglas writes, not to rub it in too much, but in Ontario, we get CBC, TSN, and Sportsnet that all show the NHL playoff games. I drive, it would drive me crazy not being able to watch. Yeah, dude, tell me about it. Okay, I'm going, we're going into playoff season here. I'm not be good. I'm barely going to be able to watch any of the games. And it's frustrating as hell, man. Completely frustrating. Uh, Aram writes, what do you think of Khabib? Signs of him being human? Are you kidding? No. He went in with the 11th ranked guy in the world who has was on a five fight win streak, won eight of his last nine fights, and Khabib just bitched him for five rounds. Khabib just mauled that guy. And full marks to that guy for surviving. That means the full marks to that dude for all the heart in the world, but never once in five rounds 11th ranked lightweight in the world, five fight win streak, won eight of his last nine fights, and never once in five rounds was Khabib ever even remotely in any danger whatsoever. He just beat that dude up like, like he would have done this, what he would have done to Ferguson, he would have totally dominated Ferguson, he would have totally dominated Holloway, maybe not as much as he dominated this dude, but the way he owned this guy, and everybody forgets this guy was on a five fight professional MMA win streak, the 11th ranked lightweight in the world, and Khabib just owned him. So yeah, no, no signs of Khabib being human to me, man. No signs of him being human at all. Uh, Matthew Alvis writes, with questions about his performance, do you get the sense that they are hiding Iron, uh, Aaron, Reich's, Aaron Reich in the trailers? What? Uh, compared to others, he doesn't have much, what? Uh, you you watched a different trailer than me. Uh, no, it's 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 a short trailer. He has a number of some of the best lines in the trailer. No, hiding somebody is when you go through the trailer and there's no dialogue shown. That's when you're hiding somebody or maybe one line. All in Aaron Reich, that was not the case for this new trailer. So I don't know. I don't know that you and I saw the same trailer, Matthew, but no. Not in the least do I get the sense that they were hiding Alden Ehrenreich. Not at all. Um, Zach Clayton Douglas writes, You should make a perk for joining Patreon that you post videos of you prank dancing. Nope! Those videos, my friend, will never see the light of day. Will never see the light of day, my friend. But thank you for the suggestion. But nope. Uh, I might have destroyed all the copies of those videos. I'm not sure. Uh, NPE94 writes, is AI Spielberg's most underrated film? I don't think so. I don't think by a long shot. I think Steven Spielberg's most underrated film is the film that I think is his best film, which is Amistad. And most people haven't even seen Amistad. And you talk to people about his best films, people won't even mention Amistad. Um, like one particular site recently put together a really bad list of the top Spielberg movies. Uh, but uh, Amistad is, I, I think by far his best, um, uh, is, is his most underrated film. Like you can argue about whether it's his best or not. That's all subjective. But I, I really think you can make a very strong argument that his most underrated film is Amistad. Uh, Santiago Villa writes, Ready Player One, almost at 400 million worldwide, 140 in China. How much more so that a sequel can be made? Uh, happy Easterns. I think you meant Easter, John. By the way, you have the coolest wife. I do have the coolest wife. Thank you for noticing. Um, well, it needs a hell of a lot more than 400 million to guarantee a sequel. It probably needs in the neighborhood of seven or 800 million to guarantee a sequel. 
but I don't know that they want to make a sequel. There was no sequel to the book. I would be curious to see a sequel to come back and visit these characters again as they confront the next threat to the Oasis or their world. I think that would be cool, but it's not like Ready Player One was designed to have a sequel. I think they left a few little open doors to do a sequel if they wanted to, but if, if they want to, they, they can. Look, at 400 million, you could do one if you wanted to. But to ensure a sequel that would make the studios go, well, we, would, we weren't planning on doing a sequel, but if we're making this much money, we have to, you gotta get into the seven or $800 million range. And I don't know that it's gonna get to the seven or $800 million range. Um, Geo writes, can you separate an actor's performance from them as a person? Saw LA Confidential and Spacey is amazing the film, even with the situation today. You know, it's funny. I, I was talking about this uh, a few months ago when the whole Spacey thing was coming up and it's really weird. This is not right or wrong. I'm not saying this is right or wrong. I'm just saying I had a really weird experience that some, for some reason, I can still watch LA Confidential, um, Seven, Usual Suspects, uh, life, uh, uh, American Beauty, I can still watch these films and I don't feel anything different. But the idea of watching a new movie with Kevin Spacey gives me a little kind of the shivers. Makes me, I feel very aw off about that, very off-putting about the idea of watching a new movie with Kevin Spacey, yet I have no problem watching his older work. I have no explanation for that. I do, I'm not justifying that. I have no explanation for it. I'm just honestly being open with you and telling you my reaction was, I realized when I popped on Usual Suspects and like Kevin Spacey pops in and I'm like, oh yeah, because at the time it was just, that was the movie. What I found out now moving forward seems to be affecting me. The stuff that I've already seen in my past doesn't seem to affect me. I can't justify that. I'm not trying to qualify it. I'm not trying to rationalize it. I'm just telling you that's what it is. Uh, and maybe you guys feel the same way. Uh, so I don't know. Um, Omega J writes, Hey John, I know the chat has been constantly bringing up Kingdom Hearts, so allow me to add to it. I know you like one player games, so you'll love it. Yeah, I actually, my favorite kind of game is not big multiplayer games. No, don't get me wrong, I play tons of World of Warcraft, but I always play it alone. I don't do instances, I don't do raids, like I, I just play it alone. I like playing an individual game. Um, and I've been having tons of people tell me to play Kingdom Hearts lately. I've never played Kingdom Hearts, but I am putting it on my list. I'm absolutely putting it on my list to play. Uh, let's see, Grant Hernandez writes, Ready Player One deserves to make a billion dollars. Yes, it does, but damn. Quiet Place, I know, right? Again, running out of words to talk about how great a Quiet Place is. And Ready Player One does deserve to be a billion dollar film. I think it's great. I love that movie. Um, and it's big action, sweeping adventure, wonderful visuals, all that kind of stuff. Steven Spielberg film totally deserves to be a billion dollar film. It's clearly not gonna get there, but I wish it did. Um, uh, Nut Luxon writes, um, hey, do a roll out Autobots Optimus Prime imitation. Nope, not gonna do that, but thank you for asking. <laughs> Nobody wants to hear me do that. Um, all right, Mike Zambrano writes, love The Quiet Place, hope they, do, do, they don't do a sequel. What's well, funny, I've heard the producers talking about what they could possibly do with a sequel. Because there, there is more story to tell if you wanted to. However, it would have to kind of be a semi-sequel. Like, it, I think you've told the story of this family. If you were to do another movie, I think you'd have to do it elsewhere in the world or in the country, whatever, of other people trying to deal with the situation. Or maybe it happens elsewhere in the world two months after the discovery about the sound freak. Sorry guys, gotta be careful not to give spoilers, my bad. But that there are more stories to tell. Um, so that you could, I'm not standing up saying, oh, I hope they do a sequel, not at all. But if they said they were gonna do one, I'd be intrigued. I'd be intrigued to see what it is they would do with it. Uh, Grant Hernandez writes, Solar Trailer was awesome. I'm now pretty excited. And that's one of the things I said about it. You know, it's a Star Wars movie, so I'm looking forward to it. But I've never been what you would call excited for Solo until this trailer. This trailer is what took me to that next notch. Like it's a Star Wars movie, so I'm looking forward to it, yes but I've never asked for a solo movie. 
this new trailer pushed me over that line. Now I am legitimately excited. I'm excited to see Solo now, and I'm glad the trailer, new trailer did that for me. I'm glad it did it for you too. Uh, the One Who Eats Lemons, what a great name, says, uh, was Andy Serkis killed off three times within a year? Well, let's think about it. Um, Snoke, check. Uh, Claw, a claw, check. And uh, yeah, and and Caesar, check. So yeah, he's saying his characters were killed off three times a year. I never thought about it in those terms before, but you're absolutely right. Uh, NPE94 writes, uh, loved you were never really here, your thoughts. Okay, so the thing about you were never really here and uh, I might have to look up the director's name. Um, it's Lynn something. Let me, no, uh, Lynn Ramsey is her name. Shit, maybe I need to look it up. No, it's Lynn Ramsey. I know it's Lynn Ramsey. So Lynn Ramsey directed it. I liked it. I liked it. I, 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 it's one of these films where, unfortunately, I heard all these incredible things about it, and I, I didn't think it lived up to the hype, but it's very good. Joaquin Phoenix, terrific performance. For those of you who don't know anything about it, okay, so it's this dude, right? He's ex-military. Uh, he's got issues, but he basically makes a living getting back lost kids, right? And he had no problem with violence, okay? No problem with killing a sucker if he needs to, right? But he's also a very, there's a complex character. Anyway, what's really interesting about the film and what really got my attention was it's directed by this woman named Lynn Ramsey. And what Lynn directed, this incredible little film that nobody talked about at first, but a lot of people started talking about was we need to talk about Kevin. And if you guys remember that film, it's amazing. And she did a really nice job with this film too and what she was able to do with Joaquin Phoenix in the film. She is really turning into one of these directors we gotta keep our eye on. I, I, like it's only a matter of time right now, I think before some big studio comes along and hands her a big film. And I like the movie very much. I, like it's not gonna end up in my top 10 of the year or anything, but it's a very good movie. Uh, I liked it and you should check it out if you get a chance. Once again, it's called uh, you, Were Never, uh, you Were Never Really Here. Um, uh, comment, um, commentate writes, super stoked for Infinity War. Love your content. Oh, thank you so much, man. I appreciate that. And yes, we are all super stoked for Infinity War. KJ Prolex writes, what's a line that really annoys you in films? Mine has to be, if I told you, I'd have to kill you. You're the best, man. Well, thank you so much. Um, I don't know. I, I, I mean, there are certain cliches that I really notice a lot in a lot of movies that really drive me crazy, but but like straight up actual lines that bother me a ton in movies. I don't know if I can think of any. Um, usually today when you hear, if I told you I'd have to kill you, it's used as a joke. Um, I mean, I guess the one line that goes along with the cliche is, not, all, not over the phone. Like, why not? Nine times out of 10 when somebody says, I could tell you, but not over the phone. There's no reason not to tell them over the phone. So that's that's part of the thing that usually drives me nuts. Uh, Luna Comics writes, so can film be balls to the wall, illogical, make little sense, but still be fun? Sure, they can, but, but, that's, but whether they are fun or not brings with it a whole different set of criteria. Criteria that'll be different from person to person from film to film. So even if the film is just ridiculous and not so, for example, um, Rampage, the new Dwayne The Rock Johnson movie. Like I said in my reaction to that movie, this movie is so stupid, but it kind of embraces its stupidity and it goes full throttle for the stupidity and it ends up being pretty damn fun. Um, but there's a lot of movies that are really stupid and they are not fun. They try to be fun, but they don't end up being fun. So it really, it's, it's like everything else. It's a movie by movie basis, but, it, but you can, yes, you can be illogical and balls to the wall stupid and still be fun. You can do it. It's, it doesn't always happen, but it can be done. Uh, let's see, Technovine writes, Pinoy fan, John, hey man. Uh, hope we get a shot of Thanos' face looking at the audience in Infinity War, like how Red Skull is in the first version shouts, you are failing. <laughs> Um, it's an, it's a very specific kind of call out for the movie, I guess. I have never thought of it in those terms. I don't know that I want him. I don't know that I ever want Thanos looking at the camera. I'll be honest with you. I don't know that I ever want that. I understand what it is you're going for. And maybe they'll give us a shot like that. But honestly, it's not something I've thought of personally. Uh, Aro 
Olsen writes, I was disappointed in the Star Wars solo teaser. Didn't even feel the need to go watch it, but now I am all in. I'm there on day one. Yeah, you know what? And, and I was the same way with the initial trailer. I was like, okay, yeah, it's good. It's good. It didn't blow my socks off. And I was really surprised when I would then go to movies like Black Panther and the solo, that first solo trailer would play and the audience would go nuts over it. And I was like stunned. I'm like, really? Over this trailer? But okay, whatever. But this trailer, this new one, I'm with you. It, it, it has made, it has taken me from being looking forward to the movie just because it's a Star Wars movie to I am legit excited for Solo. I'm legit. And it's really good to see I'm not the only one. So thanks for sharing that, uh, Aro. All right. Ali Hussein writes, uh, love your show. Thank you so much, Ali. Was there a talk, wasn't there a talk about G.I. Joe 3 a few years ago? Correct me if I'm wrong. What happened? Yeah, it just kind of fell apart. They were talking about doing G.I. Joe 3. They were talking about The Rock coming back to do it. Um, I remember they had a director who also directed the second one, was going to direct the third one. Then he dropped out of it. Then they had another director lined out, and he dropped out of it. Um, and I have heard nothing about it since. You know, I could be wrong. Let me let me just do a quick search here. Indulge me for a second. Um, G.I. Joe um, Retaliation was the name of the second one. Uh, box office. Okay, so how did it do the box... You know, it didn't do terrible at the box office. I mean, it made $375 million worldwide, but it had a $130 million budget. So that's not great. $375 million uh, worldwide is not great numbers for a $130 million budget. It's not awful, but it's not great. I'm just curious. What did the first G.I. Joe film, um, G.I. Joe, what did the first G.I. Joe film do? The first G.I. Joe film, Rise of Cobra, um, did $302 million. So it, there was a slight uptick for the second one, but I guess it just wasn't big enough for them to feel that they should continue on with the franchise. I know it didn't have great critical or audience response either. So my best guess, Ali, is that just they thought better of it and decided to give up on it. Uh, who knows? We might still see it. Never know, but I don't know anything. I've never heard anything more beyond that. Okay, Bomb Squad writes... What do you think of the show Entourage? Oh, I loved Entourage. I never watched the final season because I think it was the second final season. The show lost me because they went into that whole, um, uh, what? oh, I'm forgetting the name of the main character, but whatever. The, the main character got his cocaine addiction. And I felt like every single episode was the same. Oh, he has a cocaine addiction. Oh, he has a cocaine addiction. Oh, yeah. And then it was like five episodes in a row of that. And I just got bored of it, and I got tired of it, and I gave up on the show after that. But up until that point, I really enjoyed the show. And you know what? I really liked the movie. I did. I really liked the Entourage movie. Even though I basically didn't watch the last season and a half, I was able to walk in the movie, totally understood where we were, and it was funny. I enjoyed it. So yeah, I'm an Entourage fan. Um, Muse Tack Reviews writes... Did you like last week's episode of Arrow? Uh, the last episode of Arrow I saw, it wasn't the one where Thea left. Oh, the one with where Diggle says, I can't, ah, oh, no, I didn't. I'm over that. Like this whole civil war thing they got going on and the constant drama between, look, they need to get back to, to they need this show to get back to the magic they had of seasons one and season two. So, uh, so no, I, I didn't like last week's episode, this recent episode of Arrow. Uh, Grant Hernandez writes, last thing I promised, the Infinity War chance spot was sweet. Yeah, I get more of the Infinity War chance spot. Yeah, it was sweet. I, I, I like the trailer. Again, not blown away by it because they're all starting to feel the same to me, but that's perfectly fine. Uh, I, you can't, I think my excitement level for this movie is already kind of maxed out. I'm, I'm super excited for it. Uh, Video Punks writes, do you enjoy that Lucasfilm is embracing the Star Wars holiday special by pulling more elements from it? Example, Mala in the solo trap. Well, first of all, just because there's another Wookiee there does not mean it's Mala, but full marks to you, video punks, for pulling the Star Wars Christmas special reference. Very impressive. Um, Paul Gilmore writes, as a fellow Star Wars nerd, you need to watch a video on the Twin Flick channel it's an analysis of episode one from a filmmaker's point of view. Very informational. Great video. Uh, I'll be, I, look, I, I'm, I'm so far past 
there's like 5,000 video analyses of the, the prequels and of episode one and episode two and stuff like that. I'm, I, I've am i seen it all, I've heard it all. So I'm, I'm kind of past that, but I'm, I'm glad those things are out there to enjoy. Like clearly you saw it and enjoy it, but I've seen so many of these things that I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm moved past episode one. I've far moved past it. Everybody's got a point of view on it. I've heard a thousand of them. I don't need to hear a thousand more. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I've moved past it, but thank you for sharing that. And there's probably a lot of people watching this video who would be interested in seeing that. So that's great that you shared that with everybody. All right, uh, next one up here. We've got Hector Jeter who writes, when you and others got spoiled from an episode through the chat the other day, are you planning on hiding the chat on the sidebar in case someone spoils Infinity War during the first few days when it comes out? Um, I'm not planning on hiding it, but I am looking at some options right now I'm looking at taking some preventative measures that will um, protect people from potential spoilers. After the 23rd, because the 23rd is when the movie premieres. After the 23rd, I'm gonna be taking some extra me measures in monitoring um, the live chat. I mean, there's nothing I can do about the actual chat board, but I mean the actual questions part, the super chat thing, about monitoring the super chat um, I don't think I'll be hiding it, but I think I'm going to get somebody to kind of screen them before they can come on screen. I'm working, I will come up with something. So I'm definitely going to come up with something about that to, uh, to try to protect everybody, uh, from that. All right. Next one comes to us from Joshua Stevens and Joshua Stevens writes, you were a hundred percent correct on people hating Alden Ehrenreich just because he isn't Harrison Ford. We should give him a chance before we judge. Well, look, f first of all, this is coming from a comment I made the other day that look, there are going to be some people, a small segment, but there are going to be some people that have already pre-decided they're going to hate Alden Ehrenreich as Solo just because he's not Harrison Ford. That's it. There's, there's just some people, not the majority, just some, there are some people out there who no matter what Alden Ehrenreich does in this film, there is going to be a segment of people that are simply going to be against it and not like him just because he's not Harrison Ford, no matter how great he is. And that's just part of the reality. Now, as far as saying we should give him a chance before judge, well, yes, but that doesn't mean people can't have their opinions about how it may turn out. Like if people think it's a bad cast, like casting him was a bad casting decision and they don't think he's gonna do well, that's fine. Predictions are different from judgments. And you're right, they should see the movie, all of us should see the movie before passing a judgment, but there's nothing wrong with them predicting he's not gonna do well in it. Any more than it's wrong for you or I to predict that he's gonna do great in it. Either way. But the important thing is, is that once we see it, we take those predictions, we take those preconceptions and we leave them at the door when we see the movie, then see the movie, then make a judgment based on the merits of the performance. And I think a lot of people who are going to like it will do that. I think a lot of people who are, aren't going to like it are going to do that. And there are some people who won't like it that won't do that. They're going to bring their preconceptions. They're going to bring their pre-advanced biases into the theater with them. It happens with every movie. It'll happen with Solo too, but I think the majority of the people who like it will like it because it's worth liking. I think the majority of the people who don't like it will simply not like it simply because they watched the movie and it didn't work for them. But there is a segment of people out there who have already decided they're not gonna like it no matter what, which is unfortunate, and they're just really robbing themselves. Um, Bomb Squad writes, My Hero uh, Academia is, uh, is an anime on Crunchyroll, watch. Thank you for the recommendation, Bob Squat. You should jump on the the uh, little plug time. You should jump on the Stardust app. Sorry, this way. Jump on the Stardust app and do that recommendation. And maybe you'll see it on the show. Uh, all right. Next one is Sarah Od, who writes, "What are your thoughts about Phantom Thread? I watched it and like it, but it's a weird movie. Maybe that's why. I like it. it is weird, but it's a Paul Thomas Anderson movie, right? So a Paul Thomas Anderson movie, you got to expect a certain type of tone." And the way it, Daniel Day-Lewis was incredible in it, it's a really good movie. I enjoy it a lot. I like it a lot. I didn't know if I would have nominated it for Best Picture, but it's a solid, great movie. It's certainly no There Will Be Blood, but I enjoyed it a great deal. Uh, Chris Warden writes, WWE Survivor Series is in LA in November. That's right, I heard about that. 
That means WWE will be at Staples Center four nights in a row for NXT, Survivor Series, Raw, and SmackDown. You going? I believe we talked, me and Kaori talked about, and I'm sure Ann will, we've talked about getting tickets to it. So I, I'm going to guess, maybe not Survivor Series, but we'll probably end up going one of those nights, probably for either Raw or Survivor Series. We'll, we'll probably go for at least. I haven't been to a live WWE event since WrestleMania a couple of years ago. So yeah, we'll probably end up being there. Uh, Anthony C writes, is it true the Joaquin Phoenix Joker film is a Dark Knight trilogy prequel? Good, no, it's not. Uh, no, whoever's telling you that, just ignore it. That it, it is not. It is not. There's no way Christopher Nolan would let that happen. And there's no way Warner Brothers wants to piss off Christopher Nolan. So, no. Just whoever came up with that ridiculous notion, just ignore it. Now watch, it's true. But as far as I know, it's completely wrong. Uh, Warrington Train Spotter 2778 writes, do you watch the Lethal Weapon TV series? You know, you're like the seventh person to ask me that. Uh, no, I, I've never watched it. Not because I don't like it. I've never seen an episode not to, to, uh, to not like it. Um, but I've had a few people who watch and say they kind of like it. So maybe one of these days I'll binge it. But as of right now, I, I've never seen a single episode. So, so no, I don't know. Uh, let's see. Darth Impact writes, Hey, John, how you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. This is just for being my favorite movie pundit. Keep up the great work. Oh, thank you so much, Darth Impact. I appreciate that. It always feels nice when people just take time out to compliment you because a lot of people take time out to throw shit at you. So I appreciate that, Darth Impact. Thank you very much. Uh, Dante Redgrave writes, over under 40% that you do another live stream in your living room. Anne didn't sound too thrilled with the Oscars one. No, no, actually, Anne's totally good with doing live streams. She really is. But that day, we had just spent the entire day at Universal Studios Hollywood with her family. And we actually left early and we left her family to come back. And she, she was just a very, very hectic day. And she didn't really feel like being on camera. But you know Anne loves being on camera. She's, she's totally comfortable being on camera. We will definitely do more live streams in the future from the living room. Promise. Uh, Bomb Squad writes, Hawkeye is hidden because he is actually Iron Hawkeye. <laughs> yeah, for those of you who don't know, I've been complaining a lot about the whole Iron Spider thing. He's actually, wouldn't that be a kick in the teeth? If he shows up, if Barton shows up and he's got like an Iron Hawkeye, outfit that Tony designed for him. Because why not? He seems to be handing them out like candy now. Uh, Jesse the Savage writes, for Ready Player One, you will need 1.78 hours of animation. I did the math. The movie is like 50-50. Um, I don't know if the movie's like 50-50. Because I, I have a feeling a lot of the stuff that was live action still had a lot of CG in it. So this, by the way, goes back to a conversation we were having about there, there are some articles that were written that, that are true, that it is conceivable that Ready Player One could get nominated for Best Animated Feature, could get nominated for Best Animated Film. Because according to the rules, the way they're written, 70, it's either 70 or 75% of the film has to be animated, either by traditional animation, computer animation, stop motion animation, whatever. And there is an argument that Ready Player One could be be enough animated, enough of that movie is animated, that it theoretically, if Warner Brothers wanted to submit it for Best Animated Picture, that maybe it could get considered for Best Animated Picture. It's an interesting conversation. I, I don't know about the math you're working out here, Jesse the Savage, because I haven't done it myself, so maybe you're right, maybe you're wrong, I, I don't know. But um, it is a really interesting topic. It's gonna be interesting to see how that, uh, how that kind of unfolds. And if a movie like this would cause the Academy to go back and rewrite the rules. So that's gonna be interesting to see too. Anthony C writes, Avengers 4 confirmed to be the last Avengers movie? Nope, whoever's telling you that is lying to you. It is not confirmed to be the last Avengers movie. Uh, Yolo Dwayne uh, Fernandez writes, Yolo Dwayne, I like that. Have you heard of Gravity Falls? It's a 20 minute, two season animated show with amazing plot twists and mysteries. Watch the first episode and you'll be hooked, especially since you like Supernatural. I have heard of Gravity Falls. I have never watched a single episode. And you know what? A lot of people tell me shows I should watch and I say, I'll put it on my list. I will watch this in the next couple of days. I will give it a shot in the next couple of days and I'll report in what I think. But this sounds pretty good. I'll give a shot. I've had enough people recommend to me that I should check it out, so I think I will check it out. Uh, maybe one name writes, most likely to die in Solo, Beckett, the Woody Harrelson character, Kira, Emily Clark, or L3, probably all of them. I mean, really, since 
We never see it. They could all die. Um, if any are going to live, I would guess L3 would probably live, but I would probably put a pretty high stake on Kira and Beckett dying. I think they'd probably both die in the movie. Don't know, but we'll find out. To go to one writes, just watched your Stardust review of Rampage. Just what I wanted the movie to be dumb funny. Yeah, I was talking about that a little bit earlier, right? So I did my Star, my Stardust um, uh, 30 second reaction to Rampage because I saw the movie the other night. And what I said is stupid, it's dumb, but it's stupid, dumb fun. And it's a movie that embraces the stupidity of it. You know what I mean? They go right, they go for it and they, they embrace it. It's very self-aware and it ends up being a pretty damn fun movie. I, I'm not saying it's the greatest movie of the year or anything like that, but it's, it's a pretty fun movie. So uh, sign up for the Stardust app. Go check out my review for it. Uh, Third Man 3 writes, you notice Boba Fett is in the solo trailer at the 109 mark. He is nearly over Lando's right shoulder. You're not the first person I've heard say that, and I can tell you, no, he's not. <laughs> he's not there. Uh, there's a few silhouettes that if you wanted to say one of those silhouettes was Boba Fett, then maybe you could say that, but I didn't see him. He's not there. Uh, Big Four Dam and Alfie Gamer writes, Hey, John, you're awesome, buddy. Watch every day. Thank you so much. Uh, finally watched Black Panther at the weekend with my son, and wow, book my Infinity War tickets opening weekend. First of all, it's amazing that you saw it this late. It's So I'm glad you got around to seeing it. And yeah, seeing that movie would clearly make you want to run out and buy your opening weekend tickets for Infinity War, for sure. I love Black Panther. Probably my favorite movie of the year so far. Certainly an argument to be made for A Quiet Place. Certainly an argument to be made for... Uh, Paddington 2, certainly an argument to be made for Ready Player One, but I, st I think Black Panther is still my favorite movie of the year so far. Uh, all right. Uh, Kenny Kearns writes, fan since AMC. Thank you so much, Kenny. However, good Alden, however good Alden Ehrenreich does, some people will hate his performance simply because he's not Harrison Ford. We just talked about that. Um, it, uh, is it true about anyone who plays Joker because they're not Heath? Bring on the filthy. I don't think so. Uh, because Heath Ledger, as great as Heath Ledger was as the Joker, and he won an Academy Award for it, he was the Joker in one movie. Harrison Ford was um, Han Solo in four movies, spread over decades and decades and decades. We have grown up with him as, Harris, as Han Solo and all that kind of stuff. So it's really difficult to make that comparison. Because, yeah, Heath Ledger was great as a Joker, but he was the Joker in one movie once. Harrison Ford has played Han Solo for generations um, over a beloved series of movies and stuff like that. So I, I don't think the same applies. I don't think the same applies. Uh, let's see. Nathan C. writes, over under 30%, you sing your wrong on Black Panther song on guitar. Nope. That, I'll take the under on that. That's that's probably not going to happen. Um, very fun that you remembered that, though. Uh, Leandro Fonseca writes, Saw 23 minutes of Avengers Infinity War in Sao Paulo, met Chris Pratt, and I can honestly say that Infinity War will be amazing. Pratt is a cool guy. The people there lost their minds. Well, here's the thing, though, about that. You all know how much I'm looking forward to Infinity War. Like, I'm, I'm losing my mind for it. However, that being said, don't get too excited over them showing you one 20-minute clip. Because it might be the best 20 minutes of the movie, Everything else could suck. I'm not saying that's what it is, okay? I'm just saying we've seen examples before of like 15 minutes of a movie shown and people lose their minds and then the full movie comes out and people are less than impressed. So that is great. You would much rather see 20 minutes and love it than see 20 minutes and hate it, for sure. But I, I just, let's not get too ahead of ourselves. Let's just keep our expectations in check a little bit. I mean, obviously we're already losing our minds excited, but... But I'm glad you were able to be there, and I'm glad you enjoyed that footage, man. I wish I was there. All right, Micah T. writes, Are you interested at all in knowing about the plans for scrapped movie plans? Maybe like Amazing Spider-Man 3, Sinister Six, Dark Universe, etc. Yeah, 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 I get a big kick out of that. Or like John Schnepp did his movie, The Death of Superman, was, the Death of Superman Lives, What Happened? It's always fascinating to find out what happened to those things. Quite odd, most of the time you'll never really find out because there's behind the scenes drama no one will ever air. But yeah, I'm totally fascinated knowing stuff like that. Absolutely. Uh, Caleb writes, what do you think the best year 
of the MCU has been so far. My pick is 2014 when Captain America Winter Soldier and Guardians of the Galaxy came out. That's a good one. But hoping this year will win. Well, I mean, this year is going to be a strong contender because you've got Black Panther, which was great. Hopefully, Infinity War will be as or more great. And if that happens, then this becomes the best year. If Infinity War is as great as Black Panther or better, then this year probably becomes the best year. Because then on top of that, we've got Ant-Man on the Wasp coming. And you know what? That's at least going to be good. So it'll probably be this year. What it has been up until now, I, I don't know. I would have to sit down with a chart and look at which movies came out which year, which I can't remember off the top of my head. So I can't really answer that. But 2014 is a, a good one to pick. Uh, Darth Impact writes, speaking of negativity, a lot of people hate on Armageddon. I love that movie. One of Michael Bay's best. You know what? I say it all the time. Armageddon. Whenever people ask me, John, guilty pleasure movie, Armageddon. Armageddon. I mentioned Armageddon. I know a lot of people don't like that film, and I totally understand why. I do. But for some reason, that movie gets me. It's, it's one of the Michael Bay films that I really, really like. That and Cool as Ice starring Vanilla Ice are my uh, real guilty pleasure movies. All right. Uh, Celtic. Sorry, guys. This video is going really long. Celtic LJB33 writes, uh, will upgrade fly under everybody's radar? For those of you who don't know, there's this great stop what you're doing today. Go on YouTube, search upgrade red band trailer. It's this upcoming movie red band that the trailer is one of the most crazy awesome trailers I've seen in a long time. It looks ridiculously good, and I cannot wait to see this movie, but it doesn't seem to have that big of a marketing budget. So, yes, I think, unfortunately, no matter how good or bad the movie is, we don't know if it's good or bad. The trailers look great, but the movie might be bad. Um, the unfortunate reality is, without a marketing budget, it will probably fly under a lot of people's radars. Uh, Luis Blanco writes, Hail Hydra, hashtag Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. forever. This comes off the fact that I was talking on the show the other day and I was complaining again about Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. It's like, I'm, I'm keeping up with Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. I don't know why, because I haven't ever liked this show. But uh, Clark Gregg's great. That's why I watch it, is for Clark Gregg, because I think he's awesome. But I'm, I'm watching the show and it's like, are, and then I came up to one of the more recent episodes and I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? They're back to Hydra again? 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 With Hydra? Again. How many times are you going to be, we beat Hydra. Oh, now they're back. Oh, we beat Hydra. No, now they're back. Oh, we beat Hydra. Like, seriously? Again? Anyway, just really frustrating. So that's what Luis is, is joking on here a little bit. Hail Hydra. Uh, ZCM Zombie writes, Sunday companion video will drop when? Oh, well, it's funny because this is a companion video. It's up. It's dropping this today. Monday morning is when it's dropping. Uh, let's see. Uh, or I should say Tuesday morning. Tuesday morning is when it's dropping. That's that's today is Tuesday. Yes. Florida Project. Oh, let's go here. Um, Act Naturally Productions writes, Florida Project was an underrated film and deserved more love than it got. Do you think Disney had anything to do with its lack of success? <laughs> I know they don't like it when people film in their park. No, Disney had nothing to do. Disney is not going around sending goon thug squads with baseball bats to movie theaters saying, you're not buying a ticket to that Florida Project movie and tapping their baseball bat in their hands. No, Disney had nothing to do with that. So no, don't worry. And you're right. Florida Project is great. And uh, it got some Oscar buzz love, too, and all that kind of stuff. And if, if uh, Disney was really trying to work against it, it would have made a campaign to try to make sure that that didn't happen. But clearly that didn't. No. So no, Disney didn't care squat about what, what Florida Project did. So no, put, put away the tinfoil hat. There was no conspiracy. People just didn't go see it. I mean, it's, but, but that's true of a lot of these little stylized indie looking films, right? A lot of people don't go see them. There's, there's no difference between Florida Project and a lot of other ones. So uh, that's just a part of the unfortunate reality. But you're right. The movie is great. And Willem Dafoe was freaking crazy good in that. Uh, let's see. ZCM Zombie writes, are you going to money from Russell Crowe's auction? Oh, yeah. For, for those of you who didn't hear about this, Russell Crowe is auctioning, auctioning off a bunch of his possessions from, that he had from when he was married. 
and it's crazy. I don't know the full story about it, but he's doing an auction stuff like that. He's even like selling pairs of his underwear and just being ridiculous about the whole thing. Uh, so no, I am not personally going to do that, but that would be pretty awesome to participate in something like that. I don't have the type of money I would need to be involved in that, uh, in that auction at all. Uh, Mason Barr writes, Hail Hydra. More with the Hydra stuff. Just kidding. I'm ready for S.H.I.E.L.D. to end, though. Yeah, I was ready for S.H.I.E.L.D. to end after the pilot, to be honest with you. Uh, Pablo Diablo writes, Band of Brothers, produced by Tom Hanks and Spielberg, easily one of the best shows and true stories put to screen. We also see a young Michael Fassbender, James McAvoy, Tom Hardy. Thoughts? Yeah, I mean, Band of Brothers is... is I mean, whenever you're talking about big television events, some of the great television events, Band of Brothers is up there. I don't know that I'd say it's one of the easily one of the best shows for me, but it's definitely top tier. I mean, it's absolutely top tier. And that's what, like, it's funny, it was so influential that when a lot of movies were coming out, people would say it's kind of going to be a band of brothers. Like people reference it. Like that's how kind of influential it's become with storytellers as well. And if you haven't had a chance to watch Band of Brothers, by all means, you guys need to check it out. Uh, let's see here. Marv... Diesel writes, am I the only one who wishes the trailer for Upgrade was the Venom trailer? I am i don't know that I really follow what you're saying, Marv. Um, are you saying you didn't like the Venom trailer? I like the Venom trailer. Are you saying that you wish more people watched the Upgrade trailer like they watched the Venom trailer? Are you saying something? I'm not, I'm not really clear on what it is you're saying. Uh, Luna Comics writes, what was your first movie ever in theaters? Mine was Finding Nemo. The first movie I ever went to in theaters was Star Wars. It's my earliest childhood memory. Uh, I was so young though, I was like five, um, that I can't even remember anything after that. The first movie I went to without my parents, like I went with a friend and just me and a friend went to movies, was the Kenny Rogers movie, Six Pack. You probably never even heard of it. You'll have to look it up. But it was playing at the Limeridge Mall Movie Theater, which was within walking distance of my house. And I went to the Limeridge Mall Movie Theater and I went to see Six Pack. That was the first movie I went to go see by myself, like by myself without my family. Uh, Luna, Ka or sorry, I already did that. Um, Sterling Rains writes, some of my friends talk about The Last Jedi as if it's as bad as the prequels or worse. Film is subjective, but I personally don't get the hatred from some fans. Hey, look, that's, look, all film is subjective. That means there are going to be people that, no matter what movie you're talking about, there are going to be people that love it, people that like it, people that don't like it, people that hate it. For every movie, every movie ever made has people that love it, people that like it, people that don't like it, people that hate it. Every film. Last Jedi is a really good movie. It's not the movie that a lot of people were looking for. It's a different movie from what they put together in their heads before they saw it. But it's a really good movie. However, it's a really good movie to me. And, and that means like, they're, they're, look, the majority of people like it, but there's a lot of people that don't like it. And they don't like it because they watch it and that's just the way it affected them. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing dubious about that. It's not even necessarily hatred. But hey, look, every, th every movie you love, there are people who hate. Every movie you hate, there are people who love it. And that's just the truth of the subjectivity film. We need to be okay with that. Uh, let's see. Maybe one name writes, do you consider A Knight's Tale with Heath Ledger a sports movie? Interesting. Quite my, it, my first reaction is to say, no, it's not a sports movie, but... Really, in a way, just because it's not a sport today, you know what? I My first reaction was to say, no, that's stupid. But you know what? Maybe it, it is legitimately a sports movie. I'd have to think about that more, but that's a really good question. I'd never considered it like that, but I think you may be right. That could actually be considered a sports movie. Uh, ZCM writes... Villain in Solo is Dominic Toretto. <laughs> yeah, we were talking. We were talking in an earlier show about uh, who the villain is under the mask. It's Dominic Toretto. If that's the case, then Han Solo is screwed because nothing beats Dominic Toretto, right? Uh, the number Thor writes, "Hey John, great work. Thank you so much." Number Thor. Uh, he follows that up with best Conan movie: Conan the Barbarian or Conan the Destroyer. You know, it's funny. I just watched Conan the Destroyer again, like two weeks ago. I haven't watched that movie in years. Oh, and absolutely Conan the Barbarian. Conan the Barbarian is absolutely better than Conan the Destroyer. No doubt in my mind. All right, final two questions here. Dakota Barber writes, 
Loved A Quiet Place, got me emotional near the end. Absolutely, that's the great thing about this movie. It's not just a monster movie. It's not just scares. It's family. It's chemistry. It's bond. It's emotional. It's all of that into this one incredible package. And the final question today comes to us from Will Kindrachuk, who writes, Infinity War Rotten Tomatoes prediction. Oh, I know it's impossible to predict. Well, if you know it's impossible to predict, why are you asking me for a prediction? But I love seeing films. I'm excited for to for it to succeed critically, hoping it ends up fresh. Um, I'm going to guess 88%. That's going to be my guess. My and it's I have no, I haven't seen the movie. Nobody's seen the movie completely random, pulling a number out of my ass guess, I'm going to guess 88%. There you go. Whew. All right, guys, that was a long one. That will do it for this companion video. Thank you guys for sending all the, again, this was particularly long because it's, we built these up, all these questions up over a couple of days. Normally we get to them every day, so the companion videos are usually much shorter, but we had a lot to get catch up on, but I am committed. If you guys send in one of those live super chat questions during the John Campus show or open mic, they do get answered, even if I have to sit here for almost two hours and answer them. So thank you guys so much for participating, making the conversation happen. Make you guys subscribe to my YouTube channel. Follow me on Twitter simply at John Campia. That'll do it for me, guys. My name's John Campia, and until my next video, bye bye.